Welcome to ESVN OT, the Emma Sports Vigeland Network show. My name is Emma Vigeland, and here we are on a Thursday. Normally we're on Mondays, but we're also doing these OT episodes to give you our picks for the weekend in the NFL, also including the Thursday night game. I might have some action on that. And uh, also just generally news catch up because there's so much going on right now. With that said, let's get right into it. But hello, Bradley. Uh, working the board right now. Rolling around all hello. over the place <laughs> in his chair. Doing some roller derby over here. Yeah. Um, we uh, we may have mentioned this on our last episode, but we did not do our best work with our picks last week. So I am looking to redeem myself with some sure things. I have nothing to redeem yet. <laughs> I mean, sure things is also just like that doesn't exist uh, when you are picking against the spread because... Uh, you know, people in Vegas, people who do this for a living, they know what they're doing. But uh, we try to we try to use it particularly as like just a lens to view games um, and uh, do with that information what you will. But let's start with some of the big news coming out of the NBA because there is a lot. Um, Robert Sarver, since we last spoke about this uh, news story, has commenced the process of selling both the NBA's Phoenix Suns and the WNBA's Phoenix Mercury. He uh, owned both. And now due to a uh, an investigation done by the NBA into his racist conduct, including saying the N-word on multiple occasions, uh, and his inappropriate conduct towards his employees and people that he works with of a sexual nature, comments on women's bodies, comments on... Uh, whether or not a woman should be working due to a pregnancy and due to having a child that were sexist in nature, he has now been essentially pressured to force uh, to, to sell the team. The, uh, the, the reason for this is not out of some sort of benevolence or a learning of one's lesson. It's that PayPal and other sponsors for the team had essentially said that they're not going to be publicly associated with the Suns anymore. And uh, Adam Silver did hand down the maximum fine or punishment under the bylaws, but if he really wanted to, it could have been a situation like what happened with Donald Sterling, and I should say not if he really wanted to, if these 30 owners actually wanted to excommunicate uh, Robert Sarver, they could have done so. But there was not the smoking gun in the same way that there was with Sterling in terms of racist conduct. But this is a good news. Um, this is good news. And I think the n- number one story in when you're looking at Sarver's uh, sale of the Suns is that this was directly due to LeBron James, Chris Paul, other stars speaking out aggressively and loudly that this was not the way to go, that the punishment was not sufficient. It was insufficient. And the NBA Players Association Executive Director, uh, Tamika Tramaglio, also spoke out. And she said, you know, Sarver should not ever be in a position where he's in charge of of, uh, of a managerial position ever ever again, I believe was uh, one of her, her quotes, very strong statement on that front. So for me, why this is positive is not that a new billionaire capitalist will purchase the Suns and like Bezos is in the running. Um, I'm pretty sure I saw Bob Iger as well. Uh, you know, they, they that's that's just a changing of the guard. Um, but the fact that players are able to 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 express themselves and move needles to this degree is a really important shift in this league because they're the ones that make this league, not the billionaire owners who serve no function except to initially bundle capital to purchase the team and get it going. Once it's going, it's its own organism. People understand that. Billionaires don't go into purchasing professional leagues to make a ton of money, right? It kind of is just something that does churn money and it self-sustains, but it's not like a massive investment where you're going to see see huge returns. Once it is going, it is a creation and it's its own brand and it is of the players and the coaches and the, organ- the people within that structure that make that brand. And so 
we have to be more aggressive in pushing for not just a new billionaire, a billionaire who has a better PR team who's going to buy these teams, but actual collective organizations is where the future should be going for professional teams. We're far away from that reality, but in terms of reframing the debate around this, that's where we should be at. And like, again, Sarver will make a ton of money off the sales to so spare me this persecution BS that I'm sure uh, we'll be hearing about how this is cancel culture and, and nonsense like that. Uh, they'll, the, he will make a ton of money on this sale. And the reason he sold now is because he understood that the value of the team is going to keep dropping if he decided to hang on too much longer to the team out of, um, out of spite, which is, or out of stubbornness, which is like Dan Snyder 101 in the NFL with the Washington to com Commanders. For me, that leaves a lot of questions about where that goes. Dan Snyder under investigation for similar conduct in uh, the owner of the Washington Commanders, who has been long understood to be a generally vile person and uh, also has not managed the team in a financially sound way. His ownership has driven people, a lot of people away. Uh, including his desire to hang on to the racist name that the commanders used to have for uh, in, until he was basically forced to to change it. He said, you know, as long as I shall live, they will always be named the Washington blank. No longer, because after the Black Lives Matter movement, there was a, like a public reckoning that made it impossible for him. But he wants to pass down this team to his kids, so he's holding on tightly to this in the middle of a congressional investigation in the NFL. Um, I'm sorry, the, he, Dan Snyder's in the NFL. The congressional investigation is being done, I believe, by the Oversight Committee. Um, but once those findings are released, we will have a lot more sunlight on what was happening here because the NBA, for its flaws in this situation, was infinitely more transparent than the NFL has been in terms of Dan Snyder's conduct. Um, they released the findings of their investigation last year around July 4th weekend and hope no one would pay attention. And the findings were thin in terms of like the details. They have not released many details about what they found Dan Snyder did. And uh, for me, that speaks volumes. So there are degrees in which uh, there are degrees difference between the way that the NBA and the NFL handles their, their vile owners <laughs> and the NBA, despite valid criticism for how this was handled is significantly ahead of other leagues and particularly um the nfl which is uh you know i i would say dominates in terms of finances and uh and is definitely the nba's like main competitor for eyeballs and uh, one thing i just want to mention is i think we just have to remember to and a lot of that i that the average sports fan um and this is also, I think, due to some socializing on our part of this being a very common refrain from people being like, oh, well, you know, players make millions of dollars like that. They don't like so, like they're so rich. Like it shouldn't matter. Like they, they like they don't need to be participating this much in like in any sort of agitation or advocacy like they, they're rich. They don't need to be doing this type of stuff when it comes to labor or it comes to like the conditions working conditions and, and things like that the if you ever hear that argument you just I, you just i just want people to remember that one not everyone gets paid like lebron james does in this league there are so many people who for this this is, this is a job they are making six figures they're not making hundreds of millions of dollars and two and they have a finite period and, to actually make that money right and this is not a lifelong career this is a fixed amount of time that someone can be a, a professional athlete given the strain on people's bodies and the concentration of wealth from these teams is still despite the hundreds of millions of dollars these players are are, are incurring um for their play for their actual labor them playing the sport they are still not receiving the majority share of it that is going to the owners for essentially sitting on their ass and buying an nba team so they these people regardless of how fantastic their skills are regardless of how larger than life they are they are still laborers yep and they have a voice in this so good for them for using it to get a who who, who by all accounts is a real sicko <laughs> out of out of uh um, leadership in that organization a hundred percent but speaking of other news in the nba this broke last night and then into this morning some of the details about uh 
Ime Odoka as a uh, suspension from the uh, Boston Celtics. Now, um, Udoka had a historic freshman season with the uh, Boston Celtics and took them to the NBA Finals. But now uh, reporting from Woj and others has found that uh, he engaged in a consensual relationship with a female staff member on the team which is against the the rules for the Boston Celtics as an organization. This is a complicated story, in my opinion. Um, now, it seems like uh, assistant uh, head coach Joe Mazzullo will serve as the interim head coach in this uh, period for the suspension of, of, uh, of Udoka. And the that's kind of, to me, a, a fig leaf for what the reality is, is that they're not going to bring Udoka back. Um, I would imagine that this has fractured the relationship between the Celtics and Udoka. And um, when you're in a coaching position, having like the trust of your team and being a leader in that way is prime is uh, is primary. And so when there's a scandal like this, that undercuts that. And the scandal, you know. Here, here's one side of it. From a human resources perspective, having a um, relationship with another employee in the building does complicate things, right? Because say it's a consensual relationship, but say that relationship goes sour and uh, the, the woman who's having uh, this relationship doesn't get a promotion because of the souring relationship and it complicates things that is why there are these policies right but at the same time there is a ton of racism in boston uh and i feel like that is not being talked enough about in this context right now just we can't ask bill russell now but the great 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 bill russell experienced that when he was alive during his period of uh, a leadership of the Boston Celtics. So I, I, I'm, I feel like we need more details about this relationship to really make a value judgment, but both things can be true at the same time. This was a poor uh, piece of judgment by Udoka. Um, Udoka's loss will be felt by the Boston Celtics who turned around that organization and brought them back to the uh, NBA finals for the first time in over a decade. And like, I turned them around the Knicks, Knicks fan in me. Like I wish that it was just a mere 12 years between NBA finals appearances. Like it's, it's just the, the Celtics, you know, of course have an, uh, are one of the two most successful NBA franchises uh, in history. So it's all relative for them, but I, I am mixed on this story. Well, my th I have a few thoughts as well because to me it's a little puzzling how the rollout of the story came to pass last night from Adrian Wojnarowski and, and other uh, scoopsters for the NBA, um, as well as the not only the degree of punishment for this this um, offense, which, like you said, I'm not in any way absolving a doka of this. He had an extramarital affair with an employee of the team. Um, that, like you said, it creates an, a level, a, a huge human resources problem, a huge uh, chain of command problem. So I understand, in terms of organizationally, it was negligent and it was wrong, um, especially not to disclose it or especially not to have some more transparency around it if this was actually something important to him. You know, if this was, he was still married. I, I, I don't know if he has children, but like, it, so it's certainly an error in judgment. But many other coach, many other uh, coaches in this, I like. I, I this is purely hypothetical, but I just can't really imagine the same punishment being levied on a white or more tenured NBA head coach, um, or an NFL head coach, for example, especially or and especially for an owner or something like that, someone with a much more vested interest mm -hmm. and much more importance in terms of the financial aspects and the business aspects of the sport or of the of the or of the franchise. The other issue I have, speaking to the rollout of the of this breaking news, was. It made me feel as if when Woj tweeted it this last night, uh, basically saying, 
Udoka is going to be suspended for an undetermined amount of time for an undetermined offense related to his conduct with the organization. It just seemed kind of irresponsible for me, for me, for him to release this information that was essentially a vacuum of information and then wait till the morning to disclose further details. Like, it kind of just let this thing hang in the air without it and let speculation run wild for quite for a few hours before even knowing the details. And I was just kind of it kind of just made me feel like they were they were um, so a, a guy like Woj was basically trying to, you know, build suspense for an incoming story as opposed to just releasing the facts as soon as he had them. If he did have them at that point and didn't just wait and, and didn't receive new information about what was going on until the morning. Yeah. I mean, so all of these things are um, a are able to be true at the same time. The the way that Woj disseminated the information was uh, messy. The power dynamics of uh, Udoka and having a relationship with a subordinate is um is, is not ideal, not good, a bad um p- piece of judgment on his part. He really should not have done that. And three, the optics for uh the way that the Celtics have run their organization historically and how they have treated certain black players within their organization, the context of the city and the way that the fans have responded to black players and coaches within their organization. It all matters when in analyzing the story and we're going to get more details. But for now, um, I, I just it's a shame because that was an incredible run in his first year as being a head coach. And um it, it, like a year seems a year seems really severe and like it's not even really the actual um reality of what's going to happen because they're just trying to force him out and i'm sure this is like the in the midst of them finagling a uh, the terms of how much money he's going to get from his contract and like a buyout. Yeah, I could certainly see there being some more uh, backroom dealing in regards to the, it's some something else with or any sort of potential discontent with the team or you know contract negotiations. Certainly, the other thing that also I will say that I that I'm that is bothering me about this is that um, this got in the hours since last night when this late last night when this was reported has received and this is just anecdotal obviously i'm not watching every minute of espn i'm not i'm not seeing every tweet that they're putting out you are watching every minute of espn i am but i but i am of course watching uh every minute of espn as i as i as i sit here today um but the level of coverage from sports outlets and news outlets about that cover sports about the Ime Doko situation relative to the Brett Favre situation mm. to me is staggering. And I mean, yeah. I, I want to give credit to Mina Kimes uh, 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 during her appearance on Around the Horn yesterday. She did devote her, se- her final segment to discussing the Brett Favre situation. But this re- immediately received so much more traction. This story about a, a the black Celtics head coach having an extramarital affair and being suspended from the team than one of the most iconic NFL quarterbacks literally participating in a welfare fraud scheme with the governor of a state, one of the poorest states in the country, and has received so, like much... like. Mina Kimes' appearance, for me at least on my Twitter timeline, it was the first time I saw ESPN even mention the story. Yeah. Um, so I, and I'm not saying they never did. I'm just saying for me personally, it just seems like there has been so much more saturation about the Odoka story already over the Favre story. They're not obviously one to one, but it just seems like there's a lot of emphasis being put on something that is like I would say value in terms of value, all things being equal, much more egregious one over the other. A hundred percent. Um, All right, let's get into our locks, and then we will get out of here. This is OT, so we're not going for two hours plus like we've been uh, doing with our original uh, flagship episodes. So last week was not that great for us. Um, I should have had that that, uh, tweet up of, of how we did, but actually, let me see if I can find that. We, uh, I'm... Just, just we can like quickly go over it here. Um, and while we do that, we're trying to get Bradley on camera, but there is like some malfunctioning uh, issue with the camera, and it keeps spinning back to sleep. So if that happens, you guys are just gonna gonna uh, gonna have to deal with it. Unfortunately, we're uh, we're still working through some of the kinks, and I want to like hang a jersey up back here or something like that to make the set a little bit. Um, a little bit more less majority reportish not that i don't appreciate it but um but all right we'll we'll get a we'll get these uh 
these results up from last week up in in, in a second. Um, so last week in the uh, competition between myself and Bradley for our locks, it was a race to the bottom. I went three and zero in week one. I was really feeling myself. Week two, I went one and two, and then Bradley went zero oh and three. <laughs> what do you have to say for yourself about this? <laughs> Like, I'm bad at betting. Don't trust me. <laughs> I mean, but like... Do I, not spend your money with my with my advice, okay? This is not a betting advice show. We have been clear about this. But uh, not our best. I picked... I was really bullish on the Jaguars. I'll give myself that credit uh, there. Uh, plus three and a half. I thought they'd win that game. I'm very low on the Colts this whole year. The Bengals... I, I, do and the I I had the right idea about the Rams the Bengals I was totally off on I have no idea what the hell is going on with that team, and then I mean Bradley I feel like you would have changed your pick if you knew that Jameis Winston had four fractures in his back yeah, might have been good info to go into that that pick but uh thank you for that breaking news Sunday morning yeah so, and yeah, really appreciate that the Steelers I mean Gunner uh. Little white guy, don't know what his last name is. I'm forgetting, but he he muffed that punt. That's really why the Steelers oh, yeah, didn't win yeah, that yeah. game. Mm, yep. And the Commanders, I, well, you know, I, I I can't defend that pick no, by it's you. It's pretty indefensible. <laughs> I I that was my that was week one goggles. I was like, oh, they're looking pretty feisty, and they just they're they they're bad. The de- the defense is bad, and Carson Wentz will regress to being Carson Wentz at some point. At some point, yeah, he might still have a few like three touchdown games left in him, but. We saw this with uh, the Colts the other year. So uh, Carson Wentz is who we thought yeah. he was. And um, this week, I'm I'm hoping to get my mojo back, and I'm starting tonight with Thursday Night Football. I ha- I'm often bullish on the Steelers against the spread because I feel like Mike Tomlin always puts his team in a position to win, even if their offensive line is one of the worst in the NFL. Uh, even if they don't have a very good quarterback at the current moment, and I'm still perplexed as to why Kenny Pickett isn't playing in, uh, yet, my guess is that he just Tomlin just doesn't trust the offensive line right now. So uh, you know we're we'll have to see. But I'm concerned about the Browns' defense, especially with uh, Jadeveon Clowney being out tonight, um, especially with. Miles Garrett being a bit beat up and Mitch Trubisky should be able, I think to dink and dunk and hopefully get be opportunistic against a bit of a porous Browns defense. I was surprised to see that line. I was surprised to see how much Cleveland was favored by. It was four and a half points at one point. So for me with Jacoby Brissett at quarterback, who's been fine, but not going to be some world beater. I trust the Steelers to get, get it done with a strong defense performance and hopefully Matt Canada feels his ass is on fire a little bit with the terrible offensive uh, game plans that he's been trotting out there they've had around a little bit over 500 yards in total uh, offense in two games which is bottom five in the NFL and it's just looked bad right it's just two yard pass here four yard pass here and some of that you can put on Trubisky it's all he kind of knew when he was in uh, when he was in Chicago but but some of that I really think you can put on Matt Canada now when you saw how the offense looks looked like that last year with Ben Roethlisberger. And I think this is I, I, I see this as a good pick, but I, I do definitely agree with you with with both contentions about the opposing teams in the sense that with with a with a defensive line that has Miles Garrett, you would think that the Browns through the first two weeks would be getting a significant amount of more pressure than they are. But the issue is, if it's only Miles Garrett, he's one guy. He can't really be. He can't provide the entire amount of pressure from a front seven, even though he probably is one of, if not the the best defensive end in the league. This 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 side of Aaron Donald, um, and also. If that pressure is not getting home, their their corners and their safeties are and their linebackers are getting torched. I mean, a Joe Flacco led offense should <laughs> probably not be hanging thirty one points on this Browns defense, and Flacco probably at this stage in his career probably shouldn't be hanging four hundred yards on this on this defense and not without it without one single interception either. So I'm extremely suspect of this line favoring the Browns for that very reason. We, even though the offense certainly does still look proficient with one of the best dual threat run games in the league with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, but for Pittsburgh. 
I completely agree. I think they're really hamstringing themselves by curtailing most of the offensive strategy to Trubisky's limitations as opposed to the strengths of some of their extra, super athletically gifted receivers. That's I mean, what's crazy. I mean, they have Deontay you, Johnson and Chase, Chase Claypool. Claypool. Yeah, like two two guys who huge Claypool catch radius. Wants out. I, I'm, I'm convinced. I'm, I'm, Why I, if you? I if I were Claypool him, I has like Claypool could be DK Metcalf. Although they underutilize him too, so maybe not the best example. But Claypool has insane talent, more talent than Deontay Johnson, and he should be getting utilized way more. The kind, the combination of speed, size, catch radius, strength, like it's just kind of a disservice to them. Yeah. That. It's that it's basically most of the, the most of Trubisky's balls are, are almost getting thrown behind the line of scrimmage. Yeah, they, I, they, I don't see the point in not at least trying to do a few game breaking uh, uh, balls either down the sideline over the middle. Like use what you have. Like it doesn't and, have and to if, be Najee line... Harris and, and Trubisky. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. And if the line can't protect Trubisky, then roll him out. Like just roll him out right. a little bit on the boot. Like they and I know they do that sometimes, but only for like dink and dunk passes. Try to let some plays develop down the field. And they have Pickens, too, who who. He's he's getting publicly like mad about this kind of stuff. So I'm hoping that they feed these guys a bit. And more. and I almost even forgot Pickens is the same way. He's a strong, smart, like super athletic receiver who I think a few times literally was either wide open or overthrown in that game against um who did they play again last week? Uh the the Patriots. Uh, the, the, against the Pats. Yeah. 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 So um that's that. Now with Kansas City, I don't even have much to say. What the hell is this line? Yeah, this is insane. This line, this line, this line could, this line could be sixteen, and I probably wouldn't even. I would almost, I would almost bat an eyelash potentially. Do people? Like, did, 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 did the did the bookies uh did the did the house uh watch um? And maybe <laughs> I'll Colts regret game? this. Like maybe it's because uh and maybe it's because Michael Pittman seems to be returning. Um, the uh, Indy is at home, and there is like a sense that they're going to rebound from this. But, I mean, I don't believe in the Colts. That's why I picked the Jaguars last week. And um, I, I I feel like Matt Ryan's arm looks like probably the weakest of any starting quarterback in the NFL, even more so than Tua. <laughs> and uh, and because at least Tua has zip on, on short, short and intermediate passes. <laughs> Love Tua uh, catching that stray right there. Sorry. <laughs> um, but, like, uh, I, I just... Kansas City's, besides the Bills, the, the, those are the two best teams in the NFL. They're, it's, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think it's close. And I think Kansas City also has a long week that they're leading up to this game, and they're going to beat up on them. That's my sense. And and not for nothing, this is like this is a Chiefs team that carved up a bad defense week one against Arizona. And I think Gus Bradley is the defensive coordinator mm-hmm. for the Colts right now. Um, so therefore, he is running the most predictable vanilla defense. He's probably going to run cover three every single snap against this team. If if the Chiefs were going to dice up another middling to bad team, it would be a one that has that is not even trying to be creative on defense. That's why I'm shocked that this line is so low. If anything, it I, scares me. I feel like I, I'm missing something, but I. I what could we possibly be missing? I don't think there's really anything because I just don't think there's a whole lot of inspiration on either side of the ball for mm-hmm. the Colts right now. Yeah. I don't think they're even trying to do things that are particularly inspiring with either with either side, with either end. I mean, they're not even trying to ma- bring pressure with a like guy with like you know super athletic guys like Shaq Leonard and Quiddy Pay. I mean, Michael like Matt Ryan and Michael Pittman can only get you and Jonathan Taylor with with who's not even really getting a whole lot of help from his O line there can only do so much. It just seems like kind of a surprising line to think that they that the Chiefs would only be up by less than a touchdown against this team after two weeks. And that was the same line of uh, the Bengals versus the Jets at home in New York, which I almost took. Um, and that's shocking because the Bengals are 0-2. Same thing. And, like, and, looking, and the Jets are terrible. 1-1. Right. But like, why would that line be the same as Kansas City looking great in Indianapolis? No, that good? doesn't really make any sense to me. Either. We were talking about this before the show, but like, we were both very surprised that A, there was no bounce back from the Bengals last week. Mm-hmm. And B, um, honestly... Like we were saying, you know, the ownership group in Bengals, they are notorious cheapskates. So, like, this might not happen. But I think if there was a smart owner and a smart front office, if I'm a team that has Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and T. Higgins and the offense looks like this, 
and the offensive line after the expenditures we've made for the offensive line to upgrade it and the and I'm and we're 0 and 2 after week 1 the our quarter, franchise quarterback had five turnovers and then had a similarly uninspiring performance last week I'm thinking about firing Zach well, Taylor. Well, like I would have next... never extended him. I mean, well, no question. That was a Cinderella run. Absolutely. Zach Taylor's offense does not look like the the cre- the most creative offense in the world, despite the coaching tree that he comes from. It's very much like Jamar Chase and T. Higgins and Joe Burrow makes like, go ma- do something, make crap yeah. happen. Um, they really are not. They haven't been good in his tenure in the red zone with like the run game either. And so, I mean, I I, I just. I, I feel like I the the issue is is that the the Bengals owner Brown Mike Brown, Mike Brown is, yeah, is yeah. a cheapskate. So like that that's why he would Marvin Lewis would stay with the team for so long is because he didn't want to fire a coach and then pay him when he wasn't working for the organization. So that now that Zach Taylor's been extended, my sense is that he could have a yeah. terrible performance and keep his job. Um, but I think any any like sane organization, any like non spendthrift organization, like. If the Bengals were to lose to the Jets this Sunday to go oh, go down 0 and 3 yes. this season after making it to the Super Bowl last year, I just like I think at some point your expectations have to meet reality. Right. And lastly, um I am going with Baltimore to win by at least a field goal in New England. Um you know, historically Bill Belichick has struggled with quarterbacks with this amount of athletic prowess and ability to make things happen on their own because Bill Belichick can craft a game plan all like better than the best of them. Um, But if he doesn't have the Jimmies and the Joes to keep up with a guy like Lamar Jackson, who's just going to bust open that game plan by being so freakish, then uh, I I mean, I I just don't see them winning this game. I think there's a massive talent gap between these two teams and uh, John Harbaugh is no, no slouch either given his history in new England and against new England. So uh, this one was fairly easy for me. And talk about, Speaking of uninspired offensive and defensive game plans, I just don't even know what's going on with the Patriots right now. Yeah. Everything just looks like just kind of barren and vacuous and just like uninspired. Like like there's just no ambition with the offense right now. I don't really see how the pieces fit together. Um Max not looking particularly comfortable. I mean, Nelson Aguilar had a play or two that was like pretty. I think he had a few impressive plays, but that's just not really enough. And in it, in 2022, Nelson Aguilar should not be your number one receiver. That's the thing, though, is just in terms of just pure like pure um, roster construction, it's just very befuddling, and it's not producing like a lot of like inspire. It's not producing a lot of like encouraging results so far. And I will say, if the Ravens' defense can come back this week with a little bit more discipline and a little bit more coverage chops from some of their linebackers and safeties and Lamar plays the way that he did like he did against the Dolphins this team is really good yes they they, they had like a they were over aggressive they did not cover and account for the speed of they Tyree got Kill. burned a few times it was mostly like honestly coverage lapses it wasn't like oh like they were looking the whole defense roster wide looked bad yeah they just got they got they got a few two plays that just completely torched them and i think they'll be mad about that so for sure take uh taking the baltimore the baltimore ravens in new england uh uh, to win by at least a field goal now bradley time to come back time from your hole picks from the graveyard picks from the crypt um yeah, I'm trying to see I'm, if we can get Bradley on camera, yeah, but we're, I, we're my struggling. fear, my fear is that it's going to turn around while I'm on camera. We'll fix this camera situation. Uh, yeah, we will for fix it for week. next week. Apologies, yeah. folks, but um, yeah, my first one is I'm taking the Packers plus one over the Bucks. This is my third week in a row um, picking against the Bucks. I I'm not doing this on purpose. I don't have an axe to grind. Uh, I just I just have have coincidentally had three no weeks Mike in a Evans. row. No, Mike Evans. Yeah, I'm. I'm just thinking. No, Mike Evans. Mike Evans due to the suspension. Um, I'm now regaining my confidence every year with the Packers that I do after either like a middling week one or week few weeks in the early season. I kind of think Rodgers and this team, whether they intend to do so or not, usually take the first like two to four weeks as essentially a extended preseason to kind of get their bearings and see what they have. Yeah. I was super super encouraged with um. Rodgers regaining the connection with Lazard um, in the end zone. Um, 
I thought the tag team running game of Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon looked phenomenal. I was not expecting them, even, of course, against a relatively lackluster Bears defense, but they weren't running that running the ball like that week one. Um, and I just, think they, I just think they're getting into their bag a little bit more, using all the tools at their disposal. I trust LaFleur and the coaching staff to be, uh, to be creative on offense. Um, and I just think they're going to keep it close, and I definitely could see them kind of having a statement win early on winning this game against the Bucks, And the so, Bucks have not looked good in the first two weeks. No, like, and the it's been a slog. The, good. Of course. I mean, the linebacking core is, is, uh, is fantastic yeah. in the, uh, for the Bucks. You know, Levante, David, Shaq Barrett, uh, Antoine Winfield at the safety position, but, but Devin yeah, White, is Devin like White one another, another one of my, one of the, NFL, yeah, yeah, another great piece on the defense. Um, but like you said, I agree. The offense has not looked super, super inspired, but it's also it's also as a result because of what Brady kind of has to work with right now. You know, he's he a lot of offense is running through is running through in terms of the air game. Scotty Miller and Brashad Perryman like yeah. that's not that's not exactly what you want or what this team is expecting to be operating under so I just think this could be a, a game where the, the Packers could kind of get back into their you know usual form that I'm expecting from them um my second pick with the I'm taking the, the Titans plus a one and a half over the Raiders um at home, at home. um despite the Titans definitely getting out getting you know outclassed by the bills in more ways than one i mean you know to the point where mike Vrabel took uh, ryan Tannehill out of the game to give malik willis some run um which i don't think was a bad thing they were down literally almost five touchdowns so i get it i just think this is going to be a much easier game for the titans i don't i'm not convinced that just because they got destroyed by the bills who are as of now looking like literally the best team in the league that they're going to come back and not have a I don't believe they're going to have a similar showing playing the Raiders. So I just think like if 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 Henry can get in a little bit more of a groove, um, I thought Traylon Burks actually had a few kind of n nice plays, kind of sch schematically designed for him. I don't think the defense is going to be as bad against the Raiders offense, even with Devonte Adams and the Derek Carr connection. I just could see them keeping this one close and and getting and getting a victory. And here's another point for your favor: Mike Vrabel might be. A bit familiar with the uh, oh, of course, with yeah. The offense by uh, absolutely, Josh McDaniels. absolutely, and um, so I just think that that one could be a sneaky close game potentially. Um, then my final pick, this is probably my riskiest one, honestly. Yeah, is is uh, I'm taking the Dolphins plus five and a half over the Bills. After the Bills spanked the Titans forty-one to seven, this might not be the most um, uh, rational or or safest pick but i'm i'm two weeks in i am just drinking the mike mcdaniel kool-aid i love him i thought i was immediately gonna rue what i said about week one when they were down heavy to the ravens and the his the ability to continue to throw the kitchen sink at them and keep running these ambitious plays and these smart plays and using the personnel he's he's been using and, and using it you know using them to their greatest advantage I'm completely in. I just think that there is a chance that Mike McDaniel have may have like a literally like career defining victory yeah. to, to, this week, and might be if if there's going to be a new coach to kind of try and solve a really amazingly well coached <laughs> and hugely talented um, Bills defense that is extremely hard to score on. It might be him. I obviously could be wrong if they literally get the doors blown well, off them. It's but in Miami, right? And people, yes. um, you could you could see you could see the Bills maybe feeling themselves a little bit. It's a fun city to party in. That's where Miami catches people off guard. Yes, honestly, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Yes, yeah, Stephon Diggs, uh, uh, Josh Allen, go go out in Miami. Yeah, have right? a great time. Have a have a have the time of your life. Yeah, go to some go to some clubs. You know, get get go go to the beach. Yeah, but for like in terms of and sometimes I like to look at these storylines. I know it's a bit shock jockey or or like I don't know talking head NFL ish, but Miami's going to be looking at. The fact that they're five and a half point dogs, despite being undefeated at home. Yeah, I, I they're gonna be pissed about that. I think I, I can see that too. I, I think some of these lines, like it's interesting that some of them aren't necessarily either conforming to record or conforming to narrative. Like I'm kind of interested that some of them are not completely 
adhering to what I'd I'd fully expect. Like if you if this if this line based on the first three weeks for the Dolphins was like plus two and a half or even plus two or something, I it wouldn't shock me at all. Yeah. I would I could I could just see this game being kind of a slugfest given how the both of these offenses have looked in the in the in the past two weeks. All right. Well, that's that. We have our uh, three locks for the weekend. And I, again, I almost swapped out the uh, Pittsburgh game because I'm just so, I'm a little nervous about Trubisky and Matt Canada on the offensive side of the ball. And of course, that offensive line with the Bengals at the Jets. But given like my, I'm just pissed at the Bengals for for their performance last week. It's it's actually unbearable to watch. I I could not. (laughs) I I mean, and Burrow's doing all he can, but he just, he can't even set up these plays. And and I don't think the offense is like, looks that good in terms of the way that they're scheming for this. And it's it's not like that defense in Dallas is anything to write home about. No, I mean, of course you have, you have Micah Parsons on the edge and and, and like, that's going to give you some fits, but not much else. I mean, Diggs can be good as a ball hawk, but he's a bit feast or famine. That's right. Absolutely. And if he's not, that's fair in the sense of he's, if he's not jumping routes to get picks, it's not (laughs) super, it's not super, he's not super formidable outside of that in terms of just man, either, you know, man or zone coverage. It's really the ball production that, that he, that is his bread and butter um no but i totally agree especially thinking thinking about thinking about the investment in the offensive line thinking about the skill the talent at skill positions it's just kind of unacceptable for the offense to look like this yeah yeah and after spending money on ted karras and alex kappa and lael collins in the offseason to kind of not 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 necessarily become a blue chip offensive line but literally just to upgrade the positions from like a C minus to a B plus, so to speak, or a C to a B for them to still be giving up this much pressure. I think Burroughs was sacked either it was 12 or 16 times, something unbelievable for the first two weeks. He'd be on track to break the single season sack record. I think again. Yeah. Like it's insane. And they need to look at their offensive line coach. Absolutely. And I mean, while we're on the topic though, really quickly about Micah Parsons, you said best defensive player outside of Aaron Donald. You said you said Miles My- Garrett's up there. We're already talking about that with Micah Parsons. Yeah, I think I think if I had to rank my top five in no particular order would probably be Donald, Garrett, Micah Parsons, Jalen Ramsey, and like T.J. Watt. Nick, I would take Nick Bosa. Oh, maybe that's the even even though Watt got the award, I would I actually think you're right. I actually probably would take Nick. I would over. not put Ramsey in there right now, given I think he's he's maybe lost a step a little. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, Micah Parsons. It is, could be Bosa and Watt, honestly. Yeah. In in in, in, in like taking Jalen out of there. Yeah, and then Micah Parsons. Which is so funny to think with the Boses. It's like we pick Nick and like his brother is also like a lights out. I know. It's like what 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 genes? What I'm, genes those MAGA chuds have? I know. God. <laughs> An unfortunate. Yeah. Un- unfortunate all around. <laughs> all right, guys. That is uh our show. That is ESPN O T for week three in the NFL. And we will be back on Monday to talk about the weekend and any updates on social justice and leftist issues. <laughs> What'd you do? I went to break for like five seconds. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> well, and we will be back with any social justice <laughs> updates uh, in the NFL uh, and uh, any and leagues around. I'm totally thrown off there. And in sports, we will be back on Monday. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.